Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Midwest Dream Car Collection. I am so pleased with the turnout we had this morning. We were so concerned with the cold and icy weather that we wouldn't have anybody. And it takes a lot of work and effort to put these talks together. And Brian always does such a great job. I was hoping we'd have a nice turnout. So thank you all for coming out this morning. Brian Strouts, who's going to be our presenter this morning, uh, has been helping at the museum since our early beginning days. Brian's retired from American Institute of Baking, AIB International, where he was there for many years. About five years ago, he said now, he's been retired and now has his own private uh, consulting business. Uh, but Brian has been very active as a volunteer here at the museum. He's on our collections advisory board, which meets monthly uh, with me to talk about our collection and what, what changes, what cars we're going to be looking at and things like this. Just I can run ideas I have uh, for the museum by them. Uh, so, and Brian's always been one to step up to the plate when we want to do a talk on an interesting car to do the research on it and does an excellent job of presenting. So, without further ado, I'm not going to take any more of Brian's time up. Let's give Brian a warm welcome and... Okay. That's <laughs> We've been doing this series for several years. There have been occasions, especially uh, during the pandemic, where the schedule was off, we couldn't meet, we um, had to reschedule presentations, sometimes speakers got sick and we had to drop out and make last minute changes. So about a year ago, I told Doug, I said, well, let me take the Peerless and don't give me a month and I'll put a talk together and if one of those events happen, I'll be like the backup guy. Um, and I thought, this car is going to be a piece of cake. You know, it's a beautiful car. It's got a great history with Peerless. If you, once you start looking at it, and I thought, this car is going to be a piece of cake. Not a piece of cake. Um, <laughs> and as he said, I was at AIB for 28 years. I know pieces of cake when I see it. This was not <laughs> a piece of cake. Um, so, so we're going to talk about the company and the origins of it because that's a really, really interesting part. Um, and then we'll talk about the car at the end a little bit. But um, like all these talks, they, they are very educational. And so I think uh, what really is the beginning of the Peerless story I've got a couple of old ads here. You know, this is pretty typical of some of the old ads that I found for <coughs> Peerless, and they really presented themselves as a luxury brand. First and foremost, really from their beginnings, they positioned themselves as luxury, and we'll talk about what that means as we kind of go through, talk about uh, the history of the company and, and this particular car, but I thought this was a pretty cool, especially uh, given the way it looked yesterday, snowing outside, it looked a lot just like that. Here's another old ad um, that kind of highlights that. You probably can't read that, so let me read what this text, some of the text says. It says, whether you pick out your car at the automobile show or buy at your leisure later on, make the salesman prove his claims. There would be lots less money wasted on poor cars if more people insisted upon being shown. So they were really confident, too, about the quality of cars that they were building and how they would stand up to the test from consumers and comparisons to the competition that was out there. So uh, that, and that is very characteristic of a lot of the old ads I found, showing how quiet they were. Now, if anybody um, saw my Facebook, I actually uh, reposted what Doug posted, that uh, there's a connection between Peerless and Canadian beer, and we'll get around to that. Um, so trying to come up with a hook for this particular talk, I titled it From Suds to Suds. Um, and there's a reason for that. That's because what you see right here is actually the origins of the original Peerless company. They started out making washing machines and laundry ringers, which is really more what that is right there. So we'll talk about that. So suds to suds, we're going to cover off from washing machines to beer. In some place in the middle there, there's a car, a few cars. Um, although it's not a very long history. Let me go back just a second there. So if you go to the very original origins of the company when they were making uh, washing machines, 1869. By the time they got out of the car business, it was 1931. They really didn't get into the car business until about 1900. So 30 years is about all they really lasted as a car company, which if you put that in comparison to who's out there today, Tesla started as a motor company in 2003. They got eight more years running if they were going to hit that 30-year timeline. So 
it was a very uh, short <coughs> timeline and they grew very quickly. We'll talk about that. So that, that was one of the things I found most interesting. So um, structuring the talk to give a little flow to it, we're going to talk about the early history of the Peerless Company and how that evolved over time. We're going to talk about the timeline of the automobile business part of it. It's got a rich history in racing. They had a lot of innovations. And again, this is very early in car manufacture, automobile manufacture in the early 1900s. So everybody was being innovative. But there are some things uh, that Peerless came up with specifically that have carried over to today and, and are really are part of automobile innovations uh, that helped make them better all the time. They had one last big hurrah with a V16. And we've got a V16 Cadillac out here that if that was the, that was the benchmark that they were going for in 1931, it kind of became their last hurrah. And no spoiler alerts, but you don't see, uh, you don't see uh, a V16 peerless in our museum, although there is one someplace. Um, and then we'll switch around and talk about this car just a little bit, some specific things about it. Uh, beyond being a beautiful car, it's got some really cool features that we'll talk about. Uh, we'll open up the hood and let everybody take a look at that engine because that is really the beautiful part of this uh, particular car. So Peerless Company, as I said, it started off as a washing machine company, um, originally in Cincinnati, and then it moved to Cleveland. So if you start to look at the history of it, it's always been in Ohio, but it did make a move <coughs> between those two places. And within that world of laundry equipment in the late 1800s, they were it. They were like the world leading supplier of washing machines and hanger ringers at the time. They licensed their own designs. They found, they found other people to make for them, um, both domestically and internationally. And so they were very, very successful within that particular market. Again, some really interesting ads here that highlight um, by the peerless clothes ringer, and you can see that's very uh, period correct there. I like this one even more. It looked like an excerpt from a newspaper or maybe a magazine. And those are quotes from right out of the ad. Have you your wife's welfare at heart? <laughs> Buy a peerless washer. Practical <laughs> gifts that bring happiness. <laughs> Guys, <laughs> buying a washing machine for your wife may not be the best move. Um, We've got, a, we've got a family story on my wife's side. Uh, her grandfather, one time, um, bought a toilet for his wife, her grandmother, for her birthday. Um, did not go over particularly well. I think buying a washer is about the same as buying a toilet for somebody. So uh, they were really pushing hard. And again, think about the time. A lot of convenience, automation, a lot of design-specific things that went into these that were patented that you can find if you do patent searches. So, they were very, very successful as a washing machine company. But times were changing, late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, at that point in time, cars weren't quite taken off yet, but what was really big were bicycles. So Peerless got into the bicycle business. Um, two years after moving to Cleveland, they were again very successful with that. I'm pretty sure this is actually a peerless bicycle, but like everything on the, uh, on the internet, you got to do a lot of searching. You kind of take people's word for it. Um, this seemed to credibly be uh, an original peerless bike from the 1900s. Doesn't look a lot different than, you know, any other bicycle out there. Um, but they were very successful at doing that. But to their credit, they did see that the times were going to change. Although they were successful with washing machines, and now bicycles, they could see that cars, automobiles, was really going to be the future for a lot of people. So they entered into that particular trend. So a really brief early company timeline, 1869 was when they started. Um, in 1891 was when they switched over to bicycles. And then by 1900, they were already getting into the car business. And by 1902, they had renamed themselves as the Peerless Motor Car Company. So things were evolving really, really quickly. And that's, I think, an interesting thing, too. If you think about 
1902, they were barely a car company. Seven years later, they made this. So they were really, um, really ahead of their time. Things were produced, progressing very, very quickly. So the first thing that they did, there was a French company, and I'll probably murder the pronunciation of that, uh, Didi en Bouton, who was making engines in France. And here's a picture, uh, courtesy of the Ford Museum in Detroit, of one of those original 1900 Didi en Bouton um, engines. Two-cylinder. Um, that year in 1900, Didier Bouton produced 400 cars, but they also made 3,200 engines. Um, so they were selling engines to all kinds of manufacturers. Someplace here I think I got a note about, uh, it's estimated that they were selling engines to as many as 150 different early automobile makers. So these guys were found their niche very quickly and were building these, um, these two-cylinder two engines. By 1904, they had made 40,000 of this particular engine. So they were really meeting that market from the engine side of things. At that point in time, they were all hand-built on the bench. Assembly line work for something like an engine really hadn't uh, been established yet. So each one of these were a hand-built engine. Um, I read one citation that said they didn't even have time to test them. So if they sent it out and it just didn't work, then they just have you send it back and we'll rework it and send you a new one. Um, they were building them so fast they didn't even have time to test them. So Peerless had this supply of engines. They were uh, uh, ramping up to produce cars. The other thing I think is really remarkable too, just as a side note, if you think about how small that engine is, two cylinders, seven years later, they make something this size, 825 cubic inches. Still the largest uh, production engine ever made. To, to evolve from this to that in such a short time, I think, is uh, just an incredible testament to how, how people were thinking about the automobile industry and how hard they were working and being innovative. So by about 1900, um, Peerless establishes this plant. Uh, looks very modern by, uh, by most descriptions, I would say. Uh, they're in Cleveland at 43 Lisbon Street. They remained in this spot their entire manufacturing history, so they continued to expand it. They continued to manufacture more and more of their own parts in-house, including engines um, at some point. So they really were the modern car manufacturer um, at that time. They also had ties to a lot of other uh, brands out there. I thought this was an interesting shot of a garage someplace. I tried to zoom in and find out exactly where it was. But you can see here they're actually uh, advertising for Peerless. It's kind of washed out because it's lit up there. But Peerless, Hudson, and Essex all within the same shop. So they were definitely one of the car companies that was out there um, supplying in. Now, part of the success that they had uh, relied on the guys that were working for them. This guy, I'm probably going to probably butcher his last name, Louis P. Moores was the original designer of the first Peerless cars. So this guy had a very heavy hand in all of the design work that we see evolve into this particular car. He'd left by 1909, but he did much of the uh, in initial engine work and a lot of the design. And it was his design that was front mounted engine rear drive that was actually pretty innovative at the time. Um, in those early peerlesses, and he's responsible for that. He also designed a race car that got the nickname of the Green Dragon, and while I wish I could find out why they called it that, I could not. It meant something, but I don't know what. We'll see a picture of the Green Dragon coming up here. But just like today, where much of automobile history is based on race car success, that was very much so in the early 1900s, and Peerless really played off that as well by designing and racing cars in endurance races and road races and rally races and hill races and 24-hour runs and all that kind of thing. And this particular guy, L.P. Moores, uh, was, uh, was primarily responsible for a lot of that. Um, 
And you can find some things in the U.S. patent offices that are credited directly to him. So this is the first trapezoidal steering linkage that's still very much the basis for steering linkage on a lot of vehicles today. This was innovative in 1901, and it belongs to Lewis Moores from the Peerless Automobile Company. So while we look at something like that today and think, well, yeah, that's just how a car steers. That's the front you know, steering linkage. And that's how it connects in with the steering wheel. This was all brand new at the time. And it was things like this that helped them be successful on that racing circuit because they got here before other people did. And, and it really helped them. Um, in, a, in addition to that, there were a lot of other things that are credited to Peerless at the time. Drum brakes, uh, the first enclosed body cars. And actually, uh, some of those first enclosed cars used quite a lot of aluminum as well, which again, if we think about race history, part of the reason you're successful is you make that car lighter um, so that you can uh, get a little more speed out of the engine that you've got. It also is a reason why you don't see a lot of peerless cars remaining our way today. So think about that, a lot of aluminum in those early 1900 models. The trapezoidal steering linkages we talked about, Front mounted engine with rear wheel drive, that was an innovation in 1902. Uh, the electric lighting that we see on this particular vehicle goes back to what? They were one of the first innovators in 1911 to install that on peerless cars and this lighting carries over from that same uh, Gray Davis, Davis Gray uh, lighting company. And they were also one of the first ones to put an electric starter on. So things that we kind of take for granted today were really very innovative coming out of the Peerless company. So this guy, this is, the, this is Richard Petty of the day. Um, a guy named Barney Oldfield was the guy who raced the Green Dragon. Ironically, he started off racing bicycles. So he had a racer mentality. Um, how he got hooked up with Peerless, well, I couldn't get a clear definition of that, but he was very successful racing the car and, and racing other peerlesses. He was the winner of the inaugural AAA National Championship in 1905. He continued to race most of his life, didn't retire until 1918. And although this is a little obscure, he was the first man to drive a car at 60 miles around, 60 miles an hour around a circular track, um, which again is probably why that steering was, was helping him just a little bit. And here is a picture, not a great picture, of Barney Oldfield in the 1904 Green Dragon. Very much a stripped down looking car, probably again part of why it was so fast. I'm sure they were optimizing the engine that they had in that to, to produce as many horsepower as possible. Um, this guy probably had a little bit of a breakneck mentality as well in, um, in 1905 with this car, rated at 34, 35 horsepower, which again, from what I read, most of the time, the horsepower ratings of the Peerless were, were um, about double what they really claimed to be. So if it said 35, it was probably at least well over 50, which was quite a bit for back then. Um, this guy, Ernest Bolger and Arthur Fiesel, uh, completed the world's first 24 hour endurance race in Columbus, Ohio. They led for much of the race. Uh, they crashed into a fence partway through, but got it running again enough to finish in third place. So very much the history of Peerless goes back to that early racing to build up the name and, and the popularity of it. But by 1905 um, to 1907, so just coming up on this particular car that we have here today, the market was really expanding for them. It was growing very rapidly um, in size and production volume. And they took that recognition of race history and started to build on that luxury name. So one of the things that Peerless, people that have maybe no knowledge of or minimal knowledge is, they lop it in with the, what they call the three P's. And we've got a couple of Packards out here, and then we got the Peerless, and then Pierce Arrow was the third one at the time. Packard, Pierce Arrow, uh, Peerless, those were synonymous with luxury. 
Um, and so they really started to focus on that and come up with higher and higher price models because they saw that's where that niche market was. And when we talk about this particular car, we'll, we'll get an idea for what luxury meant in 1909 from a price standpoint. They also, like a lot of other automotive companies, were involved in war efforts. In 1911, they produced about 12,000 trucks for World War I um, in cooperation with what they were doing here stateside, working with uh, some other automobile companies over in Europe. But they were briefly in the truck business and producing for World War I. They eventually got out of that because they didn't see that where it was where they wanted to be. Uh, they didn't feel like that was a good niche for them. And so they didn't continue to focus on trucks once they did that supply um, for the war. In 1915, they introduced their first V8 engine um, to compete with the Cadillac V8. And then that really became the staple engine through about 1925. So they were focusing on big engines, luxury rides, a lot of bling as we can see here, and that's how they were building their name from then on. And I saw that's probably not going to be easy to read. I thought that would be easier. Um, so as I said, they didn't last that long. By coming into 1929, which is also marked by what else? Stock market crash in the Depression. Not a great time to be building luxury cars or luxury anything. Probably not even luxury washing machines at that point in time. Um, they saw that they needed to redesign. So before the market crash, they looked at the competition who at that time was Stutz and Marmon and said, we need to refresh things. We need to be more competitive with those guys who are really high <coughs> luxury. They uh, did a model redesign. They saw an increase in sales. So it was working for them, even though they were in the throes of the depression. And they decided to focus on that market. They, their thinking was there are still some really rich people out there with enough money to buy an expensive car. And so it did work for them for just a little bit. But by the end of 1930, um, they replaced that V8 with a, a Continental Straight 8 as a cost savings. And, and that kind of became the beginning of the end. I think they, they made a decision to cheapen or lessen the quality of the cars that they were building, both from a power and a luxury standpoint. The market, of course, with the depression, just didn't really help them all that much. And so the whole thing just kind of fell apart once you start looking at that. So really coming into the end, by 1930, 1931, they'd stripped down the entire line to a single model that was appealing just to those buyers that still had some money um, coming off the end of the depression. By 1932, 33, they decided to give it one last go and they commissioned M Murphy Body Works and a young designer named Frank Hershey to make uh, a very clean, elegant car, kind of as a last gasp effort. And this is the one that they tried to make competitive with that Cadillac V16. Um, and they produced this particular car. One car, one time, 1932, 33, maybe 31, it was a little, murky on the timeline of when it was made. This is the last Peerless made. It is the only V16 prototype in existence, and it is currently at the Crawford Auto and Aviation Museum in Cleveland, Ohio. So if you're ever in Ohio, it'd be a great chance to see this literal one of one car, and it is the very last Peerless that they ever made. Basically, just couldn't recover from the depression. Um, that's kind of where it comes down to. When you're selling luxury cars, it's just not going to work out for you in the end. So let's talk about this particular car a little bit. Um, and I was talking with, with Chris before we got started here this morning. And I, I admitted to him, I'm like, I thought this was going to be really easy. No, it, it's really, really hard to find information on this car because we think it is the last one in existence, the last 1909 Model 25, peerless race about. Um, and that makes it pretty unique. So the collection picked up this particular car from a consignment dealer in um, St. Louis about a year and a half ago. Um, and it's a, you know, we think it's a, a real 
stunner, stopper, and that's why it's usually sitting right now out on the floor right there in that turn the corner spot because it really gets everybody attention. Um, a lot of people refer to it as the chitty chitty bang bang car, so those guys that are my age understand that particular reference. I would argue that it's a lot nicer car than exactly uh, what that one was. The production numbers of this car are again a little murky. Um, tracing actual production wasn't uh, quite the science that it is today. So I found a couple of references that in 1909, Peerless made 1,618 cars. In some references it said they made that many of this, and in some references it said that many combined of the Model 25 and a Model 19. So between those two model cars, this is the 1909 version of the 19. That's the race about 25. From what I can see, from again, I gotta qualify everything because you're never really sure. This is one of two known survivors of a Model 19 from that particular year. The other one is, is a much rougher barn find that was out there on the circuit for a while, uh, disappeared for about 25 years, and then resurfaced about uh, 15 or 20 years ago. Um, so there's not a lot of survivors out there. Um, so we're really fortunate to have this one. Um, because why? What do you think happened to a lot of these cars that were produced in the early 1900s by about 19, let's say 41 or so? Yeah, scrap metal. Scrap metal for the war effort. Especially the ones that were high in aluminum. Um, there was a lot of pressure at that time for owners that if you had something that wasn't useful and it was metal, you, you turned it in for the war effort. And so that's at least part of the story that I could find on why they think a lot of these cars um, just don't exist anymore. A few things to point out on our particular car is to really look at the, at the engine and, and the detail that goes into this car at every phase, including around the engine and the engine bay. As I said earlier, um, this particular car, 825 cubic inch engine, rated at 60 horsepower, probably well over 100 in reality. Uh, one of the references that I found said Peerless didn't really care about horsepower. Their customers didn't care about horsepower. Their customers cared about luxury and style and ride. So that's what they promoted, and they frankly just didn't really even think about it. But at 825 cubic inches, and to the best of my knowledge, that is still the largest displacement engine ever put into a production car. So it's really something to see for sure uh, once you look at this car, and you can see the detail with the brass and the enamel and even the wood trim all the way down inside there. Um, the detail and the beauty of this engine is one of the reasons why we don't run it very often. <laughs> it, gets, it gets mucked up pretty quick uh, because of the, uh, the oil flow system on it. And uh, when I came, I came in on Friday to talk to Doug about what the plan was with the car, and Doug's like, you know, I really wanted to start it, and Nick, the mechanic, said, you will kill everybody in that room because of the <laughs> exhaust fume and the smoke. It's a, it's a beautiful thing, and it runs almost silent. Well, maybe not silent, but it's like a, it's like a piece of music when that thing runs, uh, the rhythm to it. So it, it's really super beautiful, and we're going to open that up so you can see that if you haven't seen that already. You know, some of the other detail in this car is certainly the, the apple green color that really gets your attention. Um, we're, uh, we're pretty sure a, a lot of this car is original. Obviously, it's not all original. There's wood parts that just rotted. There's metal parts that rotted out that when this car was restored um, to really concourse condition, there were a lot of pieces that were replaced on it. But knowing that this is basically the last one out there, a lot of this work has to be, has to be original. The, the brass work, which, again, Nick the mechanic loves polishing that brass work, but uh, it really makes this car shine and is a great example of a brass era car. So once you get a chance to look at it, take a look at all, all those lanterns, all that brass work, uh, pay attention to the detail. Some of those are kerosene. Um, that one on the back actually lifts off that if you were you know, parking in your driveway, you could pick off that lantern off the back and walk into the house with it as a light. So the amount of detail on this car is just really incredible. 
Now, there, I think there are some unique things on this car from a design standpoint too, although again, it got a little uh, murky exactly what was, was part of this, but the crankshaft of imported steel drove through unique internal expanding clutch to the four-speed transmission, and the transmission's separately mounted to the frame. So Peerless used this open drive shaft design um, and, a, and a separate um, arm between the transmission and the reaxle to absorb the torque, and it kind of helps with the ride of this. If you look at the, the leaf spring setup on this and you get a really good look at the open chassis of what the suspension looks like. So that seems to be unique to this particular car. Um, also, the, the wheel design and the way it's mounted is something that today we would call a positive offset rim with the way it's mounted on those tires. So on a, on a modern design, it looks like this where the, the, um, the wooden spokes in this case are mounted out at the exterior part rather than back or all the way back like that. And that helps with some of the steering, cornering, and, um, and ride of this particular vehicle. Although Doug would tell you from personal experience it does not corner well, even at 20 miles an hour. Um, in his test ride in St. Louis that day, he about went flying out of the back seat um, as they rounded a corner at about 20. Uh, the braking setup also seems to be unique on this. Um, <coughs> On the rear wheels, through a contracting brake band located outside of the brake drums, the handbrake actuated expands the brake shoes. Um, in comparison, this was very advanced. Most other systems employed a drive shaft brake that stopped only one rear wheel through the differential. So um, I've talked about the history of Peerless. I've talked about the race history. I've told you a few things about this car. Um, but really, the last part of the story is how did they end up connected with Canadian beer? Well, when they finished that last V16 Cadillac, that was, that was the last hurrah. And they idled that factory that we saw in that one photo um, for about a year and a half or maybe close to two years, depending on what, what date you're looking at. But by 1931, for some reason, they decided that, um, well, actually 1933, they closed the doors in 1931. By 1933, they, uh, hooked up with the Canadian Beer Company that at the time was making Red Cap. Um, today it is Heilman that then sold off to Pabst. So they became brewers of Canadian beer in that manufacturing facility. Um, they sent down brewmasters from Canada. They put in the equipment that they needed to and actually became quite successful at making beer. They changed 25,000 shares of Peerless stock for the licensing rights to manufacture Canadian beer under um, Carling's Ale was the original part of Carling's parent brewing company out of Canada back in the day. So that was it. I mean, they started in 1900. By 1931, they were done making cars. So a really, really short history. But we've got uh, a beautiful car to show here as a part of that. As I said, the name is legendary when you talk about luxury cars in the early days as part of the three Ps. So we're really fortunate to have this one along with the two Packards. Um, maybe we'll get a third example to, to roll into that at some particular point in time. So I hope some of what I told you uh, is of interest here at the museum. We love to tell the story of the car. And I think the story of Peerless coming from washing machines and bicycles to this by 1909 is just a, a fabulous story because this thing's a, a work of art, I think. So with that, I would try to answer any questions if you've got any. What's, what's the difference between the model of 19 and the 25? The model of 19 and the 25, the biggest difference um, is really the, the coach body around it. So this was... So there's the 19 right there. I think the biggest difference is really the coach body and the seating back from there. And then it had the roof, the, the, the collapsible roof that would go over it at that particular point. I think from what I could understand, it was basically built on the same chassis. Um, I don't, they made through two other smaller displacement engines in this particular year. So, so it wasn't a racing car? Not a racing car at all, no. Not a racing car at all. 
Um, and I do believe it had the, the, one of the smaller displacement engines as well, since this one holds the record as the largest. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. Brian, did you say how long they made beer? They made beer, well, uh, someplace I've got that. I think they're still making beer. Hold on a second. Um, I think they're still part of that. Uh, Amer uh, let's see. The U.S. business eventually grew to seven breweries by 1971. Um, and that's when they closed that original Cleveland plant. And then in 79 was when they sold out to Heilman Brewing Company. So they quite a few years until yeah. 1979. And we're very successful with that many plants. Maybe more successful brewing beer yeah. than they were making cars, <laughs> given, the, given the longevity of it. <laughs>